this is going to sound perhaps counterintuitive, but it's the thing that works. And the compulsion that we have is the teacher itself. And so we really lean into not identifying with it, but being clear about what is trying to teach us. So changing our relationship with it hmm. and acknowledging what's in the space, accepting it, integrating it so that we're in a place to let it go. It absolves at that point. It's no longer the um, swelling, you know, festering wound that's, you know, infected under the skin. It, it, it becomes part of the skin. And that's, that's really the approach. Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Thanks for joining me today for another discussion around nutrition and health without compromise. Have you ever battled food addiction or been close to someone who did? Food addiction can even look like an extreme diet that's exclusively made up of one thing. It can be a carnivore diet. It can be a vegan diet, an omnivore diet. It doesn't have to look like bulimia or anorexia or even overeating or even exercise bulimia, which is something we can talk a bit about as well. This is when someone may overeat and then obsessively work out just to fit into that swimsuit. To discuss these issues and help redefine how we can approach our health and nutrition while erasing food issues, I'm joined by Helene Popkin. Helene is an international expert in health and wellness, immersed in cutting edge nutrition, fitness, and spiritual thought leadership. She's on a mission to empower people to succeed in revitalizing their relationships and businesses. Helene activates change through her high-level life change programs, breaking down the debilitating cycle of toxic habits, leading you to vitality. She is a former Ford model, Master Chef cast member, mother, and principal of Purposeful Ventures. Helene, welcome to the show. Thank you. It is an honor to be here talking about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. Yes. Well, let's start with a simple question. What does nutrition without compromise mean to you? First of all, I love that you use that uh, because there are some debatable truths uh, that are out there in the public, things that are trending, the things that uh, are flexible, so to say. And then I believe there are absolute truths that I, after you know my entire life of seeking, but especially since I turned 18, really deeply seeking truths about health through nutrition, healing through nutrition, which is a gap in the medical industry, which is a gap in uh, our world, right? So, so we need to get educated. And so I took it on myself. And without compromise to me means really ad adhering to a couple of universal rules. That means like not negotiating because we're always negotiating. Like, what can we get away with? How, how can we outrun our forks? You know, like, oh, well, maybe I can have this. And, you know, and as we age, you know, we realize you can't you can't actually get away with a lot of things um, and it all catches up to you uh, over time and so so nutrition without compromise means really adhering to being honest about those truths that i have uh, been able to unveil thankfully yeah well i understand that your personal story also includes a direct connection to someone who you believe lost their life due to complications related to obesity, your own mom at the young age. And I say young because I'm in my mid forties. I don't intend to expire any time in my fifties. 59 seems really young. 59 was too young. Of course, it's my judgment. I mean, who am I to say? Uh, but yes, my mom died and on her death certificate was written severe obesity. And that was a shocker to me. And she'd always yo-yoed. Uh, so my first Weight Watchers meeting was at age five. Um, my mom was a Weight Watchers lecturer, so she was hmm. steep in that methodology uh, and then shifted to Overeaters Anonymous. So I think it was called Food Addicts Anonymous, F.A. back then. Hmm. And so the kitchen table or the, it was always having the 12 step program on it. And so the backdrop of my upbringing was really around food compulsion, food addiction. So food was a celebration and a source of joy, but food was also a source of pain and suffering. And it was an obsession any which way that, that you look at it from my perspective um, growing up. And then my daughter uh, put on, a, 
probably almost, almost 200 pounds, like around age 14. Um, probably what, what, like one, somewhere between 150 and 200. I don't know the exact number, but at this rate, she's already lost 120 of it mm -hmm. and uh, is on a massive journey of healing. And I do believe it's multi-generational and it's not so much um, genetic as it is just, I think, habitual and, and, and perhaps how we're raised, you know, just the general, you know, thread of conversation and energy. Well, and some people just overconsume a few simple foods that don't truly nourish your body. If you think about just, you know, having a pro a frozen pizza, chicken nuggets, French fries, all of these things that my kids would like to eat on the daily. Um, ultimately, if you make a lifestyle of that, even if you have those foods once a day, that can be once a day too much for many people. I think that certain foods will activate the addictive brain and everyone's got their food. It doesn't necessarily need to be chicken nuggets or pizza. It could be tomatoes. It's a very unusual one. <laughs> we don't usually find that whole foods will will trigger the addictive brain. But I know for myself, uh, pasta. I don't. It doesn't matter if it's a mung bean pasta, chickpea pasta, lentil pasta. I mean, it's just a food that I, it doesn't matter how much I make, I will eat it all, <laughs> even if I'm full. Um, and I wish that it was it was as simple. And maybe for some people it is, but I wish it was as simple as saying like, okay, I know this isn't good for me. I'm not going to eat it. Mm -hmm. I think food is so emotional. It, it's really, you know, the first thing, right? We cry and then we go to the breast. It's such an emotional thing. And, and it, it stems back to in vitro and at birth and, and every moment thereafter. It's it's a very deep yearning and it's so much more than, than, than you know, what we know is right. And I think that's the journey that I've, I've been practicing and that I'm on is really becoming more of an intuitarian and trying to, trying to get out of the extremes and really be in this moderation, which is the hardest practice for me, but it's the one that's most rewarding. Well, this is a term I'm not familiar with as it relates to diet. I think I can intuit what you mean by intuitarian, but talk to me about that word. What does it mean to you? It means that our bodies have an intelligence of, it, of their own. And after, you know, having a bachelor's and a master's degree in nutrition, studying food as medicine internationally, training uh, health coaches and helping thousands regain their health through diet and, and food as medicine, culinary programs, cookbooks. I mean, you name it. I've been the institutions, organizations, universities. Like I know a lot about food <laughs> and nutrition. Um, and it's, it's, it's taken me in the last 10 years or so, I've just been like, I need to take my brain off the shelf and get back into my body because my body has a greater intelligence than my brain ever could. And as soon when I can, when I can learn to listen to what my body needs instead of what my tongue wants or what my emotions are calling for, and I can tend to the hungers in a different way that isn't food, for example, um, then, then the hungers change and then I'm able to tap into this deeper innate wisdom that all of our bodies hold. But we just don't, we haven't really been taught how to read that intelligence and tap into it. Well, I would agree with you. I mean, ultimately, what I've found is that there are a few trigger foods. And for me, mine might be a little bit different than most. I find that anytime I've had beef in particular, so any cow, essentially, I suddenly crave all sorts of sugary foods and it comes out of nowhere. And so I personally think that there's just something in that food that is a trigger to me. So when I don't eat red meat, I don't crave those things. And so I think you follow what intuitively works for you. You find out what perhaps you have a trigger that is something that would otherwise be healthy. And for you, it just isn't. I recently took um, an Everly Well you know, food sensitivity test and was surprised to learn that I apparently have a mild um, food sensitivity to both beef and chicken. So even though I have been an omnivore, I am now making a pivot to say, okay, are some of these food sources actually healthy for me? And sometimes that question is one that may be a little bit more complicated than you'd like. And it might make choosing foods a little harder, especially if you have picky children that you're cooking for. I've been adamant that I don't want to cook separate meals for the kids at the same time. 
Um, so, you know, we make do and sometimes they don't like to eat what I have. Like last night we made some food that they simply refused. Mm. And so, yeah, they might've had extra apples after dinner and perhaps a frozen yogurt to appease them. But ultimately we made the meal we made. It was a healthy, nutritious meal and they just turn their noses up at it. Yeah. Um, these are the things that we combat. So I would like to hear from you. Um, what your advice would be to someone who's noticing one of these things, like perhaps it's a food trigger or even, you know, something that just makes them feel like they are suddenly craving something in an almost uncontrollable way. Mm, that's a really good question. I know so many people who are uh, hardcore health enthusiasts and just feel hungry all the time. <laughs> and it's so tricky because we aren't what we eat. We're actually what we absorb. Right. And so it's really important to look at, you know, what's happening in our gut, what's happening in the enzymatic you know, activity of our bodies. And that, those are really the two, two core areas where we, we absorb. Uh, so my first offer of advice, so to say, would be to get curious. Uh, get curious about that food. And not everyone can afford, uh, you know, really thorough blood testing to see food sensitivities. Um, you can also do muscle testing, which I find to be extremely effective for a lot of people. Uh, where they where they test themselves holding their uh, their thumb and their pinky finger together and then asking a question with a yes answer, asking a question with a no answer and trying to pull those two fingers away. And then you can ask your body, you know, does this make me stronger? Is this something I have an allergy to? Is this a sensitivity? Um, sometimes avoiding that food is helpful. Uh, oftentimes, like I did a food sensitivity test not too long ago and it looked like, it looked like cilantro and lemons. I was showing an allergy towards, which is something shocking to me because I eat tons of those foods, right? I've backed off <laughs> and now I probably don't have that food sensitivity. So I do want to say that what we're sensitive to, to today is not the same thing that we might be sensitive to in three months, six months, or even next year. So just not to, you know, so co you're constantly changing and evolving, dying, cells are dying and being reborn. So just keep that in mind as well. But getting curious and getting to the root of, you know, is this an emotional uh, desire? Is this an emotional trigger? Is this a, a physical trigger? I think distinguishing the difference between the two uh, is, is really valuable. Uh, so getting really underneath the surface, first of all, acknowledging, hey, this food makes me voraciously hungry um, and I need to look at it um, and or this food makes me feel bloated or this food makes me feel sick or this food makes me feel tired or this food is making me feel amped up um, and really pay attention. Uh, to, to, to what is in your food, because if you're not making it from scratch, chances are there's some stuff in there that you, that, that you might not like, that, or that your body might not like. Well, let's talk about some things that everybody should avoid for a moment, <laughs> um, because I think that there are a few. And I think um, for one, we often decide if you have an issue with food to do something like, oh, I'm going to take out sugars, but I will have a sugar replacement of some sort. So I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Even the naturally sourced ones like monk fruit and stevia, um, you know, what are your thoughts and what do you counsel people that you work with if they're trying to get rid of, it, let's say something that spikes their blood sugar and replace it with something else that maybe scratches the itch, but isn't quite uh, as extreme as omission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there are some foods I would say not to eat just in general, and then I'll get to the sugar thing. Uh, sugar is such an insidious uh, thing. It's just incredible. And that is Food Addicts Anonymous abstinence, by the way, is no flour, no sugar, which is so fascinating. Um, but some things that I would recommend everybody avoid would be things like canola oil in the United States, that is. If you're abroad, it's different. Um, canola oil, anything genetically modified, really. Um, so you have to really buy organic, look for non-GMO. That's extremely important, I feel, as a, as a, as a ground, ground rule. I think all oils that are, um, you know, refined, uh, you know, just it's just not it's just not giving energy to you. I always look at food as like you really want to be eating food that's going to give you energy, not take energy away from you. So, reducing or eliminating you know refined flours and sugars, um, of course, pr processed foods that are um, you know like luncheon meats, hot dogs, you know, just things are they're really far away from how they're grown in nature. So, one rule of thumb is that you know just eating to the ground, right? I'm sure you talk about this all the time. You, know, you just want to eat whole foods in their original form packaged by nature. That's going to be your best bet. Like fruit juices, things like that are not really intact, you know, with their fibers, they're going to spike your blood sugar. So I could talk about this topic for a very long time, but that's just broad based. You know, we want to try to eat foods that are uh, not genetically or 
uh, modified. We want to be eating foods that are whole and fresh and try to avoid dangerous salts and fats um, that are not natural, just unnatural foods. And ideally organic food, even though it's becoming so, so expensive. Um, but herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides are just, just not good for you. They're just going to wreak havoc. Um, sugar is a big topic. I think a lot of us want to negotiate with sugar too. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, people are, will go to a gummy vitamin in place of one that you would swallow just because yeah. they like it and they want it scratches that itch. But I don't know a single gummy vitamin out there that I would necessarily <laughs> say take this to right. anybody. <laughs> right. Oh, so I um, I'm a big proponent of not eating sugar. Uh, it's a it's a big deal for me because mm -hmm. uh, I think that sugar is like you're either on it or you're off it. I do look at it as addictive. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, the things that I do, I do use stevia. I'm very specific about the kind of stevia that I use. I even uh, have a plant in my garden. So I, I tend to use the whole leaf stevia to blend into things. Um, I dehydrate it and sometimes grind it myself because sometimes I just don't know what I'm getting in the package. Mm -hmm. um, so I, am, I, I do use stevia. Monk fruit I use occasionally, like on holidays you know, to make the cranberry sauce or to, 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 to have a, you know, a baked good. Uh, but for me, that's really the, the occasion. And again, I go back to whole foods, you know, that's why the whole stevia leaf to me is something that really feels right. It resonates. And I don't have this kind of ongoing, ongoing need. I've been having, I made a coffee replacement beverage uh, this week. It was so delicious. Uh, it really surprised me. And I put a little bit of stevia in and I just thought, oh my gosh, this is such a treat. Like if people could know that this existed with chicory root and um, carob and uh, vanilla and nutmeg and cinnamon. <laughs> I mean, they're all <clears throat> really delicious things. So I love that approach. I, I personally um, do also use a bit of stevia. I like mine in a liquid form, but mm -hmm. I've done things like grow uh, stevia plant also lemon verbena and mm -hmm. some um gosh what am i thinking of peppermint right yeah. and then you make like an iced tea and you can put the whole leaves in the mm -hmm. iced tea mm -hmm. and it will get sweet enough just like that so you don't necessarily even have to grind it up or do anything like that you just mm -hmm. have them in for flavor and a sun tea that you would even make which mm -hmm. is minimally processed if at all by the sun and you know some steeping of some tea bags and, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So these are all great ways to kind of scratch certain itches. Um, I have sworn off anything in a sweetened soda form for, I don't know how long it's been years at this point. Mm -hmm. And while I don't completely deprive my kids, I will let them have one now and then, because I also think that there can be kind of this taboo thing that develops in children where if they're forbidden from trying something that they will just lean into it <laughs> whenever they are in a social setting with friends so i do believe that in some cases it's like you need to have a little bit of balance like that when you're raising children but you're right in that sugars are absolutely addictive and when somebody is doing something like um, becomes addicted to alcohol they will often just replace the alcohol addiction with a lot of sugar yes Yes, absolutely. You see it all the time, all the time. And it's tricky because, and please forgive me for anyone listening um, who struggles with addiction. Uh, I do think we're all in recovery on some level, um, but I, I, it's harder to kick the food compulsive eating disorder, food addiction, because it's not like we can just give it up. If it was mm -hmm. alcohol, we could just give it up, you know, never have to look at it, go to it, but food to eat. every day, three times a day or more. So it's, it's, it's really tricky and extreme dieting uh, is just, it takes its toll. Yes. So talk to me about what your specific plan tends to be. What do you, how do you help people when they're recovering from a food addiction? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> this is going to sound perhaps counterintuitive, but it's the thing that works. And the compulsion that we have is the teacher itself. And so we really lean into not identifying with it, but being clear about what is trying to teach us. So changing our relationship with it hmm. and acknowledging what's in the space, accepting it, integrating it so that we're in a place to let it go. It absolves at that point. It's no longer the um, swelling, you know, festering wound that's, you know, infected under the skin. It, it, it becomes part of the skin. 
Um, and that's that's really the approach. And of course, we do a ton of education about what's good for you, how to take care of yourself, how to feel more comfortable in your skin through, of course, delicious you know recipes and learning about food as medicine and learning different embodiment practices or exercise fitness, uh, different breathing exercises combined with movement and sound. So there's, there's, a, there's an integrated approach with, of course, a nourishment or nutrition, embodiment or fitness, and then the spiritual spiritual aspect, uh, which is non-denominational, but that there, um, there is this, this mindset piece that's also connected to a spiritual uh, practice, a relational competency, so to say, uh, with self and other. So that's the basis of it. It sounds kind of big because it is, it's, it's life-changing, <laughs> right. um, but it is well, the you- thing that I realized lasts forever. Um, all the other stuff early in my career were diet programs, meal plans, um, you know, small group, six weeks. And, and this is what works. Mm-hmm. And that brings me so much joy. People call me today who, uh, whose lives changed 20 years ago when we worked together and they called me and they said, today, I'm still using the things you taught me. Like you are with me in the kitchen, you know, and uh, it, it, that, that just brings me so much joy. So going headfirst into what the addiction is and why is essentially what you work to tackle. I would say so. Yeah, you could say that. You could say it in those words. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. What is it trying to show you? What is it teaching you? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's always there for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's hard to look at, though. Well, and I think, you know, when we talk about comfort foods, this is something that we covered somewhat in depth when I was covering the content of Dr. William Lee's book, Eat to Beat Disease. And um, people develop really strong emotional connections to those foods that they look at as comforting as a child. Mm -hmm. And often those are unhealthy things. But for me, it was something like saltine crackers with mustard. And I'm just talking like the yellow mustard because I liked the flavor of the mustard and I loved saltine crackers. So I would just coat them in mustard and eat them like as a snack. (laughs) So it's probably not the worst thing in the world, but you know, we develop these attachments that are emotional that relate sometimes to our family practices or what we ate in the winter months when it was cold out or how we were able to splurge on the weekends or, or some sort of like that. So our relationship to food isn't always developed in the most healthy of ways. Mm. We're scratching some sort of an itch with that consumptive practice. And so if we can actually be encouraged to replace some of those less healthy comfort foods with a healthier version, I think that sometimes helps people kind of get over that hurdle as well. Oh, yeah. And I believe there are also some supplements that can help. And there's core reasons for that. A lot of times people have an issue with absorption of nutrients. They might not be getting enough of a specific fat like omega-3s, or they might not be getting enough of the proper probiotics to really digest their foods well. And so suddenly now they just aren't getting the nutrition that their body needs. And therefore they have out of control cravings, which they have a harder time managing. I mean, there are certain foods that I think everybody should have on hand to help them manage their satiety issues. Like if they're having an issue of feeling full, there's one that I keep on hand that I absolutely love, which is walnuts. I can't seem to eat more than a handful of them. And it doesn't (laughs) matter that they're, you know, I, I, I know people who maybe could consume a little bit more than a handful of them. But for me, I can basically eat a handful, which is a serving of walnuts. And then that's it. Yeah, feel satisfied. Yeah. And so I think you have to find those things that work for you. And you can develop a healthy plan that won't feel like it's, oh, gosh, this was so hard for me. Because when you talk to somebody who says they're constantly hungry, usually it means that they're not nourishing themselves in some small way that that could really change things for them. Absolutely. I also keep chlorella on hand and, and liquid chlorophyll. Those things are really, for some reason, I take them and I feel satisfied. Not everyone experiences that uh, because their need is is deeper than that. And we don't always have time to reflect in the moment about what am I really hungry for? Mm-hmm. And uh, I love walnuts. I actually just recently uh, soaked and then dehydrated walnuts with a little bit of stevia and cinnamon. Oh, wow. 
They are so good. And I, 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 I got to make another batch because everyone's kind of walks by and takes the handful. <laughs> it's so fun. So it's like a healthier version of spiced walnuts that you would see handed out as like a holiday treat even. Yes, exactly. That's you, great. Have pecans, you can put it on salads. Um, I also like to do it kind of salty with um, soaked almonds and tamari and dates or soaked almonds with just rosemary, garlic and lemon. That's also a delicious, delicious um, way to I just have seasoned nuts on hand, things that are delicious and abundant. That's one thing my clients always say to me is that, you know, it was so much fun because it was so abundant. I didn't feel deprived. Mm -hmm. And I think that's key for long-term change, uh, especially when it comes to diet. Um, one of my favorite foods in childhood was, um, were, so Tang, of course, we ate and drank a lot of Tang. <laughs> I'm dating myself. I and haven't even uh, heard that word in so long. I can't even <laughs> an orange powder. It was so tasty. And I used to eat um, hot dogs with white tortillas and I think Velveeta cheese. I grew up, I, I mean, just so intense. Um, but I haven't found a veggie dog yet that makes me feel good. So I have haven't had a veggie dog in an eon. So I don't even remember, but I do that those, those emotional ties to our childhood are just so so important. And if you are craving, if you have cravings, it's really important to, to, to get curious and look deeper. Is this emotional? Is this physical? Is it both? Um, and then to get supported, to figure, to figure it out. And that means testing and then observing and trying there. It's not like you, you figure it out like that. That it's not usually like that just to kind of, you know, for the listeners out there, just have patience with yourself and, and look at it as an inquiry to, to, to work with, because it, it's there to teach you. Another thing I will say is often we're not drinking enough water. Oh my gosh. And so it's a, such a simple thing. If you wake up first thing in the morning and you drink a full glass of water, that is the best way to start your day, even before you have your coffee or oh, anything especially, else. Especially before. <laughs> yeah, especially before. Yes. Um, you know, even though when I was nursing my babies and they were waking up in the middle of the night, I might have just started my day with a cup of black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> These are the realities of motherhood. But uh, that being said, you know, we should be drinking two, three, even four liters of water a day and doing so can really support your body's ability to cleanse out the things that can be gunking up your system. And that is consuming more than your body technically needs. But yes. that doesn't mean that um, it is going to harm you in any way. And often that's something that really helps people get rid of stubborn pounds, take care of any hunger issues. And then you can eat smaller meals throughout the day and not feel like you're, you know, under eating. Which it's I so think true. I mean, have you ever read that book of your body's many cries for water? Mm, no, I have not. Great book. I recommend reading it. Everything from depression to anxiety to headaches to menstrual irregularities, uh, all are cured simply by hydration, adequate hydration with pure water. It is, I know it sounds so simple, folks, but it's, I, I, I know very few people who are adequately hydrated. Uh, I, I go by this rule and, and let me know if, if, if you agree. Um, so if you go to the bathroom every two hours, you're probably pretty well hydrated. And if your urine is not dark yellow, it's kind of clear, maybe tinted a little bit if you're taking B-complex. Um, but that, that, those are two indicators. And it's like you, you use the prevention metal, me method. You don't wait until you're thirsty. You actually uh, drink water so that you, know, you don't really get thirsty. Some people disagree with that, but I'm curious what you think about those indicators for people to kind of hold on to. Well, I'm a big believer in hydration, and I also think it gets somewhat complicated when you're talking to people who spend a lot of time working out or using saunas, because then what can happen is your electrolyte balance gets thrown off. Most people don't need a daily supplement of electrolytes, but if you get to a point where your sweat literally doesn't have a salty taste to it, it's time to ensure you get more electrolytes. Okay, that's, um, a, good, that's, a, good, that's a good reminder. I actually don't have a taste, a sweaty taste to my sweat these days. Yeah, it's something that I noticed when I was training for marathons, because I did a lot of distance runs. And you're talking 30, 40 miles a week, um, in addition to other weight training and everything else. And I would get to the point where literally my sweat did not have remotely a salty taste. And so um, it was one of the things that would contribute to um, bonking, as they call it, in <laughs> intense exercise, where you just feel like you hit a wall, right? Um, so it can happen from not having enough uh, carbohydrates stored within your muscles, but that usually isn't it. It's usually that you actually have had 
too low of a sodium level and we're not just talking straight salt it's you know all of the salts essentially all of those electrolytes yeah and so um there's a few great products out there but generally speaking i just say you know listen to your body if you start to crave salty foods because you're drinking so much water and you're exercising and you're sweating a lot or you're doing sauna routines to help detoxify then you need to consider, you know, perhaps supplementation with some of your water soluble nutrients, which can mean things like the B vitamins, um, but also electrolytes. Yeah, I really appreciate that reminder. Uh, C plasma is something I've been on the lookout for. I found one good company, but yeah, I'm thank you for reminding me of that. I've, I've, I've slacked on my electrolytes and I saw them just about every day of the week. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that's it's like a little known secret because um, sometimes people will actually be low energy too when their electrolytes get off balance. So um, it helps with a lot of things. I mean, our bodies need salt. There's a reason that we mostly evolved wanting to live close to the sea, right? <laughs> to get our salt from the ocean. <laughs> so what are your go-tos when it comes to supplementation? Because I imagine you're getting most of your nutrition from food. Um, you're beautiful. You look healthy strong, all of these things that you want to achieve throughout your life. Um, so let's talk about that. Yeah, I believe that our soil is depleted of macro, so micronutrients. So the macronutrients perhaps are intact, but it's very expensive. If anyone's ever had a, a garden, then you know how expensive it is to, to nourish the soil, to mend the soil, or how hard you have to work for the compost to have the nutrients that it needs uh, outside of the you know phosphorus and, um, and calcium and magnesium and whatnot. So I think it's really important that we take into consideration that our foods do not have everything we need. And that's an unfortunate reality, but they've tested the food and it's true. Mm -hmm. So we have to take responsibility. So every day I take a number of different things. Right now I'm working uh, on my adrenals and my thyroid as I'm going into menopause. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely taking a lot of care for those. So those are some kind of carve out supplements that I'm, I'm using just for me personally. Um, outside so of I that, imagine heavy on the B vitamins. And yeah, B complex, mm -hmm. um, omega three fatty acids, uh, B twelve because I, I I'm primarily plant based eater. Um, I also take um, NMM NMN these days, which is a precursor to NAD. So I used to take NAD, mm. but now I'm taking NMN. I do to take a um, liposomal vitamin C. I also take. Um, Let's stop for a second. I want to make sure people understand liposomal. So a liposomal vitamin C is something that is essentially better absorbed into your system. And so you can get the benefits of the vitamin C more, well, just more easily, because otherwise, if you're consuming them from foods, you tend to also be consuming them with things that enable your absorption of them. So liposomal vitamin C is, it goes right into your skin for one, if you were to put it on topically, which can be very health, healthy for your skin, but you can also consume them. Mm -hmm. Did I cover the bases? Oh yeah, absolutely. And then I also take uh, marine phytoplankton and shilajit, which is a kind of a resin. Uh, so those are, those are ways I get, you know, macro micronutrients. Uh, so that's really important to me. Um, and there's one other that I take, I take some other things from time to time, kind of when I notice I'm feeling weary or I'm needing a little extra of this or that or the other, but those are some of the, the basics. And I also take enzymes, different enzymes, um, taking enzymes for digestion, not all the time, but from time to time, I do take systemic enzymes to help uh, absorb and kind of microphage, eat up things, you know, that, that do some cleanup work. I did that on an empty stomach. So in, that's, in that case, just to, for clarity's sake, for our audience, you typically consume enzymes to help you digest food when you eat or a little bit before, but when you're trying to do that cleanup, you have to consume them on an empty stomach. And that can do things like also break away, um, like let's say you've got a really bad bruise in your leg mm -hmm. and it's like a hematoma, then you wanna be able to consume those enzymes on an empty stomach on, with a regularity to help break away the tissue that needs to heal and, and you know ultimately be repaired. Absolutely. If you eat a lot of high protein diet, it also goes in and, and, and absorbs that excess protein. Mm -hmm. um, it helps to keep uh, disease at bay. Um, it, it helps to promote, you know, a strength, a strengthened immune system and, and graceful aging. So they're, um, so they're enzymes. If you, if you go to the store and look, it's, it's high protease, so proteic enzymes. Mm -hmm. So protease is, is, uh, is, is that, um, and then I take other enzymes to reduce biofilms and things like that. So I'm really into enzymes these last, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years. So I, I do take kind of high doses of enzymes. And then yeah. I, 
I go through phases where I stop and I start and I stop and I start. Um, like right now, I'm not taking probiotics. Uh, so I'm taking a little break from all uh, mushrooms and probiotics uh, from now until probably November, maybe even the new year. So I, I like to I like to stop certain things and then start others. It's not. And if you're listening to your body, then you can tell what's working and and when it might be time to, to try it again. I used to do um, I say do like it's something you know, solicitous, but um, <laughs> I used to do a, a flat of bio K about once a quarter, which is just a yogurt style probiotic that's got super, it's a super charged with all these acidophilus and everything else in its living state. So it's like a liquid yogurt, you shake it. And instead of having one of those little containers last four days, I would just, you know, do it almost like a mini meal, right, and have the whole thing. Mm. And what I found was that that really supported my digestive health. So I try to do a reset like that with probiotics periodically, but I also don't consume them every day unless you're considering the probiotics that come from the foods I consume. And it's important for people to know, like fermented foods, kombucha, these these are all like natural sources of probiotics. And you can yes. get them from your food too. You yes. even get some probiotics just from eating vegetables and fruits, grains. I mean, they're in your food. I mean, the recent research that I've been reading in the last, I don't know, five or six years has really been talking about probiotics being generated from a variety of fiber. So mm -hmm. the, even just a few weeks ago, new research came out, uh, I think from Italy, that said we need to eat over 30 different varieties of fiber. So it's not about getting your grams of fiber. It's about getting the variety of fiber because apparently the the probiotics or the good bacteria mm -hmm. that grow uh, in your, that proliferate in your gut uh, from an apple or a pear or a squash are all different and we need each of them. So the, the more variety of soluble and insoluble fiber we can eat from fruits and vegetables, the stronger and more fortified our microbiome is, which is gonna- 100%, help. yes, I love it. Everything. And this, uh, this is why it's also critical that we eat the skins of fruit yeah. because the skins of fruit have all of that in there and they tend to be much higher in the fibers. Also the nutrients or the mi micronutrients that are present in a fruit, more of them exist within the skin of the fruit than the flesh of it. And so just being mindful of that, if you like to peel your apples, perhaps eat the apple skin separately. <laughs> If it's organic, yes. <laughs> Pick organic. It's very, very important to choose organic fruits when you're going to be eating the skin of them because it's almost impossible to clean them well enough to remove all the pesticide residues. <laughs> it really is. You know, I, I am coming back. Can I go back to one of your one of your earlier comments? Of course. Yeah. Um, so we all kind of get that hankering for something, you know, like scratch that itch you said, mm -hmm. and uh, you said you handful of walnuts. And I do want to mention, and I, and I alluded to it earlier, but even just uh, some homemade nut milk with some mm -hmm. cinnamon and stevia. Uh, mm -hmm. that, it's just such a nice, satisfying, fulfilling thing. And, and I have to say that I've been doing a lot of soups as well. Believe it or not, something about soup is so nourishing. And at the same time, it's cleansing and it's it's satisfying as well. And so the results that I get from having a soup ready to go or knowing how to make a soup quickly uh, has been extremely valuable for me when I really want something and need something. Uh, and then, of course, sometimes roasted vegetables can also scratch that itch because if it's, especially if it's like cauliflower or sweet potatoes or squash, squash has got to be one of like the top so excited we're coming into squash season. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to, to kind of plug those things for people who are looking for creative ideas. Yeah, and there are some spices that are so super helpful too. Um, there's cinnamon as a for example, which is often in sweet treats actually helps to modulate your blood sugar. And so you won't get the same spikes off of even natural sugars, which means you'll be more even keel, which yeah. means you won't enter the state of being kind of in this addictive cycle the same way. You can even take cinnamon and just put a little bit of the powder in your coffee grounds and brew your coffee that way, get a nice cinnamon flavor, add some nut milk. I mean, it's just such a fabulous trait. And I also really, really love using turmeric in foods because golden milk, oh my gosh, like just add some sure. turmeric to that nut milk mm -hmm. that you made, um, a little stevia, it's delicious, it's divine. 
Yeah, I've been doing so many herbs. Um, I have to say, I'm starting to realize herbs are perhaps more important than, than nutrition. They make me feel so good. Parsley, cilantro, but also like, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but Chaturavri or Shavaratri. I don't know. It's a, I know Indian- what you're talking about, but I also am not confident in the pronunciation. Uh, yeah, there's maca root and then ashwagandha. Mm-hmm. Like I've been doing a lot of lattes uh, like golden milk, but with other um, other herbs, they really, really satisfy me. And, and ginger, ginger is another one that I use a lot. Yes. Well, it sounds like you're also inviting our audience to fall in love with food again, which is a topic we hit on so many times through our conversations around <laughs> Dr. Lee's work, because when you get to real whole foods, get into your kitchen and start to explore the bounty of foods that are available to us, something magical happens. You know, eating shouldn't just be putting the food in your mouth. I mean, part of the joy of it is really the preparation. It really is. I have to say that it's a, it's a life skill. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the longest time, you spoke about, you know, raising kids. And, and I think that I was so strict with my daughter and it perhaps led to some of her food issues perhaps. I think it definitely did. I think that also bringing the kids in the kitchen with us and Mm -hmm. having them see the life skill they need too. And I just don't know how we can entrust the health of our future generations to restaurants these days or prepared foods, because that's really what it's about. When you're eating genetically modified foods, which is pretty much what's happening whenever you eat at a restaurant that doesn't sell organic food, which is rare, even in Northern California, uh, where you'd expect there to be organic restaurants everywhere. There 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 aren't. No, no, there are just a few. And as a priority in your life, if you just commit to eating organic food and eliminating genetically modified food, including oils, uh, it is it is a huge step forward for future generations. And so it is a life skill to know how to satisfy yourself and your family um, in your own kitchen. And, yes. and it's also not complicated. You just got to find a couple of recipes that you love, get those down and then get a couple more and then just keep building on that. That's right. One of the things I like to encourage people to do if they have young children is to involve them in the grocery shopping. And what I would do with my um, oldest son, I would take him to the grocery store and just say, I want you to pick a food. You just pick something from the produce area and we're going to design a meal around it. And in this particular time that really stands out to me in a memory, we were in a Whole Foods visiting my older sister in Colorado area. So we're in Colorado Springs. He picks up a Buddha's hand. And Mm -hmm. I had never cooked with a Buddha's hand. And I'm like, what is this food? And what are we going to make? So ultimately, when we got home, we had to end up doing some Googling and finding out what a Buddha's hand is and how to prepare it and what to use it in. And really, it's a citrus, right? So it's a lot like a lemon in flavor, has a ton of pith. So we ended up creating something that would leverage the fact that you could zest it forever, seemingly. (laughs) And um, ultimately create like a nice rice and chicken dish that my my kids ended up loving. It was really fun for them. It wasn't incredibly complex and it engaged our creativity as a group. Really, I think if you can look at shopping that way, if you can try to find something that you've never cooked f- with before and then design something around it, it can be liberating. Mm, I totally agree with that. that. That was a challenge, though, that your son presented. <laughs> He's like, I know I'm going to stump her with this, right? Which yeah. is also fun. And so again, these are things that you'll remember later. There are stories that I like to tell. And so now when my son, who's seven now, will say at bedtime, mommy, tell me a story. Sometimes I'll pull that one out. Oh, that's so great. I love it. And as my daughter got older and she was on a path of health, um, she actually had her own cart at the grocery store and she was doing her own meal planning. And although we did eat together, uh, she also wanted to take responsibility for a large portion of what she was putting into her body. And then she also learned how to budget. Um, Our children also need financial competence. And that was a, a huge help for her now that she's on her own to know how much groceries cost every week and what she can work with you know, literally in the kitchen and with her finances. So I think there's a, a huge opportunity for learning and it's, we are so busy and I know we are all so busy and the gradient can be so steep to getting us in the kitchen together and co-creating something. I mean, we're making it sound like it's like graceful and easy. Like, you know, <laughs> sometimes this doesn't look like that. And I just want to be you know, mindful of that for the parents out there and just to have patience and keep trying because the more you can expose your children to kale and other foods that seem unusual to them, Uh, later on it really pays off 
Mm. Well, that's just amazing. Now, I want to t make sure I touch on your podcast because I've also guested on your podcast. And I know that will be airing relatively soon as well. Um, you have a podcast where you share a lot of this knowledge with the world and you obviously, you know, a lot around these subjects. So I'd like for you to talk for a moment about Vitality, your podcast, and what your aim is, how you'd like for people to reach you and where they can find out more. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I do have a podcast called Vitality, Women Leading Audaciously. And so, of course, <laughs> you are uh, a guest on the show because uh, there are some amazing women who uh, we have meaningful conversations uh, about their rituals, their self-care rituals, because uh, this balance, their so-called balance that we talk about uh, can be challenging at times. And we don't always give ourselves permission. So it's just so wonderful to share and co-create uh, these 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 ways to recharge ourselves. Vitality is is for me something more than health. It is the essence of you. Vitality shines through when you're really aligned with the core of who you are in its truth, non-negotiable truth of what is. And um, I love how you said uncompromised because it's very similar that audaciousness. And to achieve vitality, we have to uh, start really aligning with that. And so um, you can get a podcast on Apple, um, Vitality. And my website is jennifer-helene.com. You'll find recipes on my blog, um, information on how to contact me. That's jennifer-helene.com. Well, that's beautiful. Now, I also want to remind people that we will include these links directly with show notes, including the link to Jennifer Helene's podcast, and that is simply Vitality, Women Leading Audaciously. Um, I also want to invite you, if you're open to it, to share a recipe or two that I can include with our blog and show notes. Is that something you'd be open to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like Perhaps one? something with a Buddha's hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. I have to think a little bit more closely about uh, which ones to share. There's so many. I'm just, uh, yeah, so inspired these days. I've been getting the CSA boxes. And so it's oh, just wow. like. Yeah, abundance, abundance, abundance. A lot and, of vegetables, uh, so many things to think about. Now, <laughs> another topic I wanted to be able to get to today, but which I think we should come back to in a future episode, relates to the power of movement um, to really con you know, contribute to your overall health. So I'd like to invite you back on a future episode so that we can dig into this a little bit more deeply. And I just thank you so much for your time today. Mm, so It's a pleasure. Thank you. It has been such a pleasure to have Helene with us today. Visit orlonutrition.com for our complete blog about this episode, including features you won't find anywhere else. I know we talked for a moment about omega-3s today, so I want to remind everyone you can go to orlonutrition.com and receive an extra 10% off your order for those powerful omega-3s. All you have to do is use the coupon code NWC for nutrition without compromise, the number 10, at checkout. That's NWC10. Thank you for joining us today on this journey. If you have questions about what we covered today, please feel free to reach out via our social channels at Orlo Nutrition or send me an email directly to hello at orlonutrition.com. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either-or.